Go ahead and open your Bibles to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. We're going to begin there this evening. I know I've talked to you a number of times and over the course of this as, as we've gone through, especially as we've gotten into this section about Satan and, and his fallen angels. I, I've told you a number of times that we're coming up to talk about Satan coming before God and exactly how should we view that and how should we uh, consider that as, as something, you know, in regard to Satan and, and his interactions with God himself. And, and, and certainly the place where we go to understand this, or at least to see this, maybe in its most clear point, is here in the book of Job. Let's, let's begin reading with verse 6. We'll just... We're going to read verses 6 through 12 here of 1, then we're going to drop down to chapter 2 and read 1 through 7 uh, to begin our class tonight. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking, about, walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. And we drop down to chapter 2. And it says again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power only. Spare his life. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. So what do we see in, in these two texts as we consider this interaction, this, this time in which God or Satan came into the presence of, of God? We see, first of all, that there is a time as established here twice there is a time when angels come before God. Now, it doesn't get into the details of what that entails. Part of me says that uh, anytime anything, angel, man, or whatever it may be, comes into the presence of God, uh, aside from Satan, there's going to be some worship involved, right? Certainly some paying homage to God because he's worthy as God for that. Maybe they are giving an account of themselves and what they're doing. Maybe they are there to receive the instructions of God. And certainly we understand that God could give them instructions any way that he wants. But there certainly here is a situation where they are at a set time coming before God, the angels. And along with them comes Satan in this particular case. And it is clear and beyond debate that Satan can and does come at these times. And it's not a problem because we've already talked about it. Satan's no threat to God. Never has been, never will be, can't be. It's not even possible. And so his coming into the presence of God and coming before him here, 
uh, is, is not something that is of any threat to God whatsoever. It's not a threat to God's holiness. It's not a threat to his righteousness. It's not a threat to him in general uh, in any way. You know, evil, while evil, God cannot abide evil, evil does exist before him at times. Evil can be before God. You and I come before God in times when we have not lived our lives as we should. We go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness for those things that we have done. We come before Him sinful, and He forgives us. And so it is, it is something of, along that line probably, but the real issue when we think about God and the ability for one to be in His presence or one to be with Him or God cannot abide sin or unrighteousness, we're talking there not about a proximity thing or a location thing. We're talking about a relationship aspect, right? Right? God cannot be in relationship, in a relationship with that. That's why our sins separate us from Him. Our sins take us away from Him. That's why Jesus came, right? To redeem us, to bring us back into that relationship with God that we were originally designed to be in, to become that son or daughter. See, that's relational, isn't it? And so we can't be that with sin in our lives until Jesus Christ's blood washes those sins away. We cannot have that in our lives. Satan has no such or type relationship with God. He is, if you want to characterize his interactions with God, he is exactly what his name says he is. He's God's adversary, right? That's what Satan means. He's God's enemy. He is not in relationship as the angels are, as we've already talked about them being sons of God, that family of God in heaven, while we are that family of God here upon this earth. We see that God knows exactly what Satan is there for. You know, that's really not even in doubt, is it? I mean, Satan, Satan, God doesn't need Satan to show up so that God knows what Satan's up to. God knows exactly what Satan's up to. There's nothing God needs to learn at any time and ever in history. Satan kind of gives a rambling answer to God's question, though, doesn't he? Asking, what's he doing? Oh, I'm going about the earth. I'm walking around. I mean, it's, it's just kind of this rambling answer. He's, he's not really getting to the point of why he's there. And I find that interesting. And there's a part of me that looks at Satan, and uh, even when we think about him tempting Jesus. That's bold, isn't it? That, you, you know, you think a lot of yourself to think that you can tempt the Son of God. That you can offer Him what's already His. Remember He said, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. That's already Jesus's. He's given Him something He doesn't even own. And so there's a, there seems to be an almost an aspect of self-deception. That the devil's so deranged in his lies that he almost seems to think that he can do something that he can't. Have you ever known somebody like that? That lies so much that they literally seem to have trouble figuring out what's real in their life anymore? I've known people like that where reality in their life was a a thing that they just couldn't quite find because they spent so much of their time hiding their life and, and being deceptive about it. But you know, he rambles this answer off, but and he answered without actually saying what he wanted, and that, that bit of self-delusion seems to be there. He cannot even uh, talk to God, the God that he knows knows everything. He knows exactly why Satan is there, yet he seems to try to hide what he is doing. He just cannot help it, it seems. And Jesus said as much. Jesus in John 8 says that when he speaks, he speaks a lie because this is who he is. That's his nature. God tells Satan what what he's there for. I know that question. It sounds like a question. And and it's kind of a translatory issue with, with that question where he goes, have you considered my servant Job? It's almost like God's throwing Job under the bus, right? 
But that's not, it's not really God asking a question about your offering Job up to Satan. He's saying, you're here because you are considering Job. That's the thrust of the, he, uh, of the original language. You're here because you are considering Job. You're here because you want Job. You are considering my servant Job, aren't you? Why? Because he's faithful. Because there's no one on the earth that is like him. I can promise you that Satan wants to destroy the very best of God's servants. He can see them. He knows who they are. And I guarantee you that he has a a great desire within himself, as we see here in this book, to destroy such people. And, And so as we serve God, we need to understand that as we increase in our faith and as we give ourselves more and more to the purposes of God in this world, we're going to meet opposition. The devil's going to bring opposition to us because he doesn't want us doing those things. He doesn't want us serving God. He doesn't want us helping the cause of God in this world. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Peter says, Your adversary, the devil. See, don't ever forget, he's the enemy. He prowls about, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He wants to destroy you, devour you. And and so, you know, that's the enemy. And and, and when you think about ideas of of warfare or you look at Sun Tzu, one of the key things is know your enemy, right? Know who you're fighting. My uncle was a bomber pilot in World War II, and I have a lot of his stuff that that I found after my great-grandmother passed away in his sea bag. And they had a, a book that had all the airplanes that they could run across, and they were to know their enemy, right? To recognize that plane by its shape. To recognize him. We need to know Satan, folks. As he is an enemy like you. It's hard to imagine. And he is extremely good at what he does. The devil then, after God asked him, he, when God says, you, you're... you're You're considering my servant Job, right? There's no one like him. And the devil then accuses Job of actually having a shallow faith. God just said, there's no one like him. And he says, no, he's not really that great. He's not got that much faith. You've made it hard to tempt him. He tells God that his blessings have made it impossible to tempt Job. And we go back up to verse 3, and if you look at at chapter 1, the first few verses tells us how wealthy Job was. Verse 3 says that he was the greatest man in the East. Now, folks, that's saying something. And we're talking about the East, we're talking about the area of Babylon. So to be uh, the greatest in that area means that Job was very well known and very wealthy. So he says, you put a hedge around him. I mentioned to you Sunday morning about the, the shepherd boys in Africa that I saw, the Maasai boys, but there was something else about that, not just the going to the watering holes, but you would also see these circles of bushes out, out, on, the, out on the plains, and, and it was acacia bushes. Acacia trees have thorns about that long on them. The only thing that I'm aware of that can eat them are elephants. Elephants have that a very thick tongue and they can eat acacia uh, branches. But the, those shepherd boys will take those, those limbs and those branches and they'll, they'll weave them up into a circle, make a, literally a hedge of that acacia, that, those thorns, around their flock at night. Why do you think they do that? Lions. <laughs> That's right. To protect the flock. They put a hedge around them, right? And that's what Satan is accusing God of doing. You've put a hedge around him. I can't get anywhere near him. You've blessed him so much, there ain't a thing that I can do. And the idea is that God has so blessed Job that Job would be an absolute fool to reject God considering what God has given him. 
What about us on that one? Just that thought, just taking, walking away from Job for just a moment. What about us? Isn't that true of us? Wouldn't we be absolute fools to walk away from the blessings that God has given to us? I mean, when we think about what we have and what God has offered to us, and, and I'm just talking spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ, if that was all God ever did for us, those are blessings that we would be incredibly foolish to walk away from. But he does far more, and we know that. The devil's accusation is that there is a point that Job will turn on God if those blessings are removed. That he's just in it for what he can get out of it. And that's the accusation. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 it said, John says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. Did you, did you hear what that just said? You see what's going on here in Job? The devil is there before God and he's accusing Job of being faithless, right? Of being shallow. Of being just materially oriented. He's making accusations to God about a faithful person. And what does John say? He says, that, or the voice that he heard said that there is an accuser, right? That accuses the brethren day and night before God. And so you have... You have this idea of, of this accuser. And we'll come back to that. Yes, sir. Foolish to turn away from God. Uh, he has told us that we can't be tempted above what we can bear. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think God really knows the heart of Job and uh, that his, his faithfulness is, is sure. Well, I think, there, I think, and we're coming to that, that I, you know, there is an example. I mean, I think this is an example of that. I, I think there's an aspect to this that that fits. And, uh, you know, some people, they, they struggle. They struggle with this, what, what takes place here in the book of Job. They struggle with why God allows Satan to go after Job like he does. And, and, and you know, well, when you look at what he does to Job, it's... It's every, he's all in, isn't he, against him? Um, but God, in this particular case, I think we need to see what's going on here. God allows Job, the accusation's against Job, right? And God allows Job to prove the devil wrong. Right? Tell you what, when somebody says something about me, I, you know, or makes some kind of false statement about me, I want to prove I'm I'm not that, right? And God allows Job to prove it. Now God could have said it. God knows Job. He knows what Job's going to do. But if God says no, Job won't. Job, that wouldn't matter with Job. The devil will go, yeah, that's just what you're saying. I mean, no, that's just how the devil is. He's not there to listen to God. He never has. And so God lets Job prove it. No better proof that there could be because the devil rejects God's knowledge through his own self-deception. Job is the best to reveal the lie in this accusation by the devil and God limits though the devil in what he can do. He doesn't let the devil just do anything. He limits him at first. He limits him to anything but can't touch Job, right? And Paul mentioned a while ago first 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 where Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you but such as, common, such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God does not allow us to be overwhelmed by Satan. I mean, we've already talked about the attributes of angels and we've talked about you know, certainly in many ways, angels have far more abilities than we do. And so it's very possible with what Satan has at his disposal, he could overwhelm a person, right? And yet God's not going to allow that to happen. As loving parents even, 
as we think about God as a father, we think about us as, as loving parents as well, there are times when we let our kids go through some things, right? I mean, we could stop it or we could get in the middle of it and, and, and interfere with it, but sometimes we let our kids go through maybe a difficulty, let them find their way through it. And, and what we know about our child and what we understand about our child, we understand they can get through it. We want them to learn from that. Some of the greatest learning experiences I guarantee you you have in your life come in adversity. We don't learn nearly as many lessons when things are going great as we do when we're struggling to get through something, right? That's where we get stronger. That's where we learn about ourselves and about what God will do for us. But there are things as parents, while we let our child maybe go through something that we know that they can find their way through, but we want to see them do that and learn from it. There's also things we see that we go, I don't think my child can deal with that right now. They're not ready for that. And we step in and prevent that, right? We do what we can to stop it. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing with God. He knows what Job is capable of. And in this particular case, he is allowing Satan to do these things, but he knows what Job's, what Job's faith is and what Job's abilities are. I wonder, I wonder if there's something here seen with, with Job's children. You know, Job seemed to believe that his children were not living right. I mean, that's, that's what we see at the beginning of chapter 1. He, he seems to think his children are not living as they should, that they're cursing God or, or, turning, or sinning against God. In verse 5 of chapter 1, it says that after these times of celebration that his children were going through, these feast that days that they were going through, that he would then go out as a patriarchal father would. In the patriarchal age, it was his job to, to go to God on behalf of his family, that he was offering burnt sacrifices for his children and what they might have done. But there seems to be a thought in Job that his children weren't what they needed to be. You know, in verse 13, we see Job's children are celebrating again. And this seems to be another one of those times where Job worries that his children are sinning and even maybe cursing God in their hearts, the Scriptures say. In verses 18 through 19, Satan kills Job's ten children while they are in the midst of one of these feasts with what appears to be a tornado, right? He kills his, all of his children right there. Here's my thought about for us to maybe consider. Does Satan have the power to do what he wants with those that are his? I mean, if his children aren't godly, if his children are in the hands or in the realm of Satan, following him, did Satan have just the ability to do what he wanted with them? You know, he was limited in regard to Job, but, but kills his children. Seems without almost any uh, restriction whatsoever. You know, if that is the case, it's another clear demonstration of the difference between being a servant of God and being a servant of Satan, if that is the case. God takes care of his while the devil sees, that, though, sees those that follow him as expendable. He has no care for them except in how they may further his agendas or his goals. In this particular case trying to get Job to sin. Another answer to that same thought, though, and, and I, I try to bring everything that we can think about with the text as well for consideration, is that they were included in the statement that of all that belonged to Job was placed in Satan's power in verse 12. Because we also see in verses 15 through 16 that Job's servants were also slain, right? All but one in both, both cases. And they came and they told what had happened. You know, the devil, after he does these things, and it's hard to, it's hard to imagine having a day like Job had. Could you imagine that? I mean, he's getting all this news in a short period of time, right? It's tough to get, it'd be tough to get this news over a year. You know, if I, if I had four months between every time one of the, a servant came in, that'd still be hard. It'd be a hard year. 
But literally, the servant's coming out, going out, and one's coming in to tell him the next set of bad news. And, and he loses pretty much all of his possessions and then all of his children in a matter of minutes. That's what he's hit with. And I'm amazed at Job. And I'm, I, I see an example of what I would hope and you know, it's just one of those things that you just have a hard time putting your hands around or your mind around. But I would hope I could face it like he did if I faced that kind of tragedy. To worship God. Is that our first thought? To say to his wife, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I returned there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Now that's pretty straightforward. It's the next phrase, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. If the Lord did this, it's right. Whether I understand it or not. Well, that's tough, isn't it? That's faith. That's devotion to God. And so that happens. It doesn't work. Job loses everything, and it doesn't work. He doesn't turn on God. He instead worships God. He proves the devil wrong. It wasn't the hedge. It wasn't the blessings that made Job faithful. So the devil returns, and God confronts the devil in regard to Job's continued integrity. And he even speaks about the fact that God has allowed these things to come up on Job. Uh, with, you know, God says, I've allowed you to do this without cause. In other words, Job didn't deserve this. Job, Job did nothing to have these things come up on him. God said, I've allowed you to do this without cause, and yet he's still faithful. Now that's really key to the book, isn't it? Because isn't that the argument of the book? That Job's suffering, Why? Because there's a cause, right? That's what his friends are saying. You've sinned. What have you done, Job? What sin have you committed, right? That you couldn't suffer unless there was a cause for your suffering. And yet God, right here at the beginning of the book, says, I've allowed it to happen, and there's not a cause. Job doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve what you're doing to him. But God has, God's been proven, Job's been proven by the things that Job did. You know, the devil again turns right around. I mean, even in the face of this, he turns right around again and accuses Job of being weak in faith. And he said, oh, if you, if you take his health, right, you touch him. Oh, yeah, he could live without the stuff, but boy, I tell you what, you take his health away from him, he's done with you, God. You want, I want to touch his flesh. I want to hurt him that way. He said he'll walk away. God again allows Job to prove the devil wrong. Once again, the most powerful proof there is. But again, God, while allowing this to happen, allowing, giving that permission, he puts boundaries on it, doesn't he? What are the boundaries he puts on it now? Can't kill him, right? Can't take his life. You ever thought that maybe Job had wished he would? <laughs> I burned my finger this last week, and that's bothersome. But can you imagine having boils or something sores from the bottom of your feet, okay, to the top of your head? And they are. As you go through the book and you begin to hear Job talk about these sores, they are festering sores, infected. And I don't, want, I don't mean to get graphic, but I just want us to understand what's being done to the man with worms in them. Now, Aaron, you might be able to do a class and explain to us how that works. Uh, and, 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 you know, by the time we get to the end of the book, he's sitting in the garbage dump taking pieces of clay and just scraping his sores all the time because he's in just that bad a shape. He is in, his, his sight, 
the sight of him is so bad that when the three friends show up, they are in such dismay over his appearance that they don't even talk for seven days. The devil brought down this terrible disease upon him. And again, Job proves the devil wrong. You know, Jesus, he allowed his 11 disciples to prove the devil wrong too. Remember, he tells them as as they are in transit from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, he tells the 11, he it says Peter, but then when he says you, he's talking, it's plural. He's talking to all of them that the devil has requested to sift you. That's plural. And then he comes back and addresses Peter, singular, after that. The devil wants to sift y'all. See, he's, he's come before God like he has here and said, I want them. They're going to walk away. And Jesus allows them to prove him wrong. Now, they stumbled, right? No, there's no, there's no denying that. The disciples stumbled that evening. They ran away. They left Jesus. Uh, if we wanted to put some kind of ranking system, to, uh, John, I guess, did the best of anybody that we have recorded. I don't know what the others did, but John being there at the cross certainly uh, says something about him. Peter was there up until the point that he made that final denial and ran away. But, um, you know, they stumbled. But they never left. They weren't Judas's. You know, they, they, they came back and they lived lives of great faith uh, in God and, and serving uh, Jesus. You know, the purpose of the book of Job shows us how God works with man. And we see how the devil interacts with God in regard to us. I know we, some people, you know, sometimes we say, well, the book of Job is about patience. It's really not. I mean, certainly James mentions the patience of Job, and, and, and there is a lesson to be learned there, but the book of Job is about God. The entire argument is about God. And how does he handle things? How does he deal with things? How does he do things? And his three friends had it wrong. And in fact, Job even had it wrong. And even when you come up, even into the New Testament, 2,000 years later, they still got it wrong, right? Remember the disciples asking Jesus about the blind man who sinned him or his parents? As if sin had to be a reason for someone's suffering. See, they still have that mindset. It's still there. And yet the book of Job says that that's not what God is doing. You know, toward the end of the book, in fact, the last last person to speak other than God is the youngest person that's there. He, he doesn't speak throughout the book because Elihu was the youngest of the men that were there. And he even acknowledges that, that you have four more years than me. But Elihu seems to speak for God initially. And he condemns the three friends because he says, you're making accusations of sin for Job that you can't back up. You can't show Job what he's done wrong. You can't prove he's done anything wrong, so you're wrong for doing that. But he also gets on to Job, doesn't he? Because Job never sinned with his mouth. He never sinned against God. But Job... How did my mother put it? Got a little big for his britches. Not, anybody hear that besides my mom? From my, my mother the only one who used that phrase? Because Job, you know, he said, God will come down here. I, I can straighten this whole thing out as if God needed his counsel. Elihu says, you're not really in a position to be telling God. I love it because there there appears in that scene to be a thunderstorm on the horizon. And Elihu starts to say, God's behind the storm. And then God shows up in a tornado. (laughs) I like that. 
And he tells Job, I'm here. Kind of a, you going to set me straight now? I'm here for your counsel. What does Job say? Anybody remember what Job said? <laughs> I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> yeah. He said, I put my hand on my mouth. <laughs> and that's... Isn't that what we try to tell our kids sometimes? Sometimes it's better to say nothing. <laughs> well, Job got the message just in coming into the presence of God. He said, I put my hand over my mouth because I spoke when I should have been quiet. See, he understood what he had done too. But God doesn't let him off the hook, does he? He spends three chapters asking him questions. You know, if you're so smart and you know so much to be able to tell me what to do, you answer my questions, right? He said, now gird up your loins and answer my questions. And he does that twice to Job. And then ask him questions that I guarantee you and me can't answer either. No man can answer. Because they're the questions of God. But we see that God knew what Job would do. And Job proved it true. Yes, Satan was, and I presume, he still is allowed to come before God. It's not a relationship. It's adversarial. And Jesus is our advocate now. Right? Jesus is our advocate who defends us before these accusations and he may even allow us to prove Satan wrong by how we deal with temptations. When the devil says something about you, Jesus may allow him to be proven wrong by you because Jesus knows you. Maybe this is a part of that spiritual battle in the spiritual realm that we have discussed over the course of this class. You know, Satan has no reason to lie about the unrighteous. They are already what he wants them to be. His accusations, his lies, are always going to be about us. It's all going to, always going to be about those that are faithful to God, right? Those are the ones he's after. I just find it amazing that he thinks he can tell God. I mean, that he can go to God and accuse us of things that God would know whether they're true or not. But he does it. I guess one thing we could think about is not to disappoint God when he gives us the opportunity to prove the devil wrong, right? That's not disappointing. Let's prove the devil wrong. Let's be what God wants us to be. I told you we would look over the works of Satan, and we'll do that quickly here. I spent more time in Job than I meant. I noticed on the front of my class book here, I had January to March, so I missed my target anyway, so I might as well just keep on going. Uh, how valuable choice is yeah. to God. Our choice to God is... It's just what it's all about. Whenever we think that, uh, take for instance, Abraham carrying Isaac all the way up to the top, to the very brink of death. But what was what was the choice? The choice was that he could have done that, but it proved to Abraham's self because he didn't know when he went to the top of the mountain. Well, it's just like everybody said, uh, God, why didn't God just say, hey, Abraham, I know, I know your heart, so you don't need to go through all of this. And by the same token, why couldn't he say, I know your heart, why do you have to be baptized? Yeah, I mean, when we think about Abraham, which is more powerful? I mean, to just say Abraham was a real faithful guy. He was faithful to God. He was the father of the faithful. Or to tell you about him willing to sacrifice his son because God told him to do it. Which one is more powerful? 
One's words and one's action. And God gave Abraham the opportunity to demonstrate his faith. Faith is a thing on the inside, right? Uh, that's what James is talking about. You know, that's why works have to go along with it. It's like love. Love's on the inside. It's within us. But it's not worth much if it never comes out, right? If it's not ever demonstrated in some particular way, love is, is not worth much if it's just kept in me. Repentance is an inner thing. It's a thing that I do within. It's an inner decision. But it's not worth much without a demonstration of that repentance, right? What John the Baptist called fruits in keeping with repentance. And so here is this great faith that Abraham has, and God gives Abraham this opportunity. I mean, we need to understand that God never... I mean, there's not where God's going, I wonder if Abraham's going to do it. God knows exactly what Abraham's going to do, and he gives him the opportunity to demonstrate just how fantastic a faith he had. I mean, to take a knife and be bringing it down to slit the throat of your son, your only son. That's tough, and that's faith. <laughs> yes, sir? Oh, Paul. Paul. Like you said earlier, it's that proving uh, that God allows us to prove to ourselves that we can be faithful. Sure. Sure it is. I mean, you know, there are times when Abraham, I mean, we can certainly look and see where Abraham, at times his faith failed a little bit. He, str he stumbled. Hagar, the whole situation with Ishmael and Hagar was where he just didn't let God do what God was going to do. He tried to preempt it. And that caused some problems, didn't it? Because he went, uh, you know, beyond what God was wanting to do. And, and so, but, you know, God then gives him, then after that time, that opportunity. Of course, you know, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that comes into that, right? Because on that same mount where he held that knife to his son's throat, God will let his son die there on Mount Moriah. And so, you know, that's certainly God seeing all the way forward to Christ. Well, we think about the works of Satan, and, and, and I mean, we're certainly not going to, and tonight will be the last class that we have on this, uh, on this topic, but, you know, he is the author of sin. It began with him. John says that to us in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Uh, it began with him. It began with what he did there in the garden. Uh, he tempts us to sin. Matthew 4, 3 called him the tempter as he came to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what. If he was willing to go after Jesus Christ and tempt him, do you think he's really going to hold back from you or me? I don't hold, I don't hold any illusions <laughs> that the devil looks at me and is intimidated by me. Now, he's, I hope he's intimidated by my faith. I hope he's intimidated by my dependence upon God. But he's not going to be depend, uh, intimidated by me. The only strength that I have or the only ability that I have to deal with Satan comes from Jesus Christ. I'll lose every time without him. But he still wants me, right? He'll still come after me. I mean, you look at Job. I mean, the faith that he had, and yet the devil, he went after him, didn't he? He went after him full bore. And, uh, and, and, and you know, he, he's not going to back off. Paul even said to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5, that the tempter might have tempted you. You know, he was worried about that. He lays snares for us. He tries to trap us. Paul told Timothy, uh, you know, that he said, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. The devil is going to lay traps for us. He's going to make a, try to get us to believe something is true when it's not. It's a, it's a deception. It's a snare. And we'll get hung up in it, right? Because we'll like what we hear, and it's not true, and it... it wraps around us, and we, we're, we want to stay there because that's exactly where we want to be. And, and it becomes a snare until we get ready to throw that snare off and realize, I may like it, but that's not what I can be and be pleasing to God. I'm going to be caught in the devil's snare. Yes, sir? I think it's the, to me it's the deception. You know, the devil deceives us that the end of the journey is when we die. You know, that's what he wants us to think. We've got to get all our licks in between yeah. now and the time we die because after that... It's over with, you know. But it's really, you know, it's how we view our journey, you know, because the devil's trying to tempt you with things of this earth in, in order to steal spiritual rewards from you. He's trying to take something from you and give you something. It's, it's, your, it's your temptation. It's the temptation. But if we see that our life is not about ending when we die,
but just the rewards begin, then you look at your temptations differently. And, and I think you look at Job, you know. They took everything in the world he had, but he still had faith. His, his world didn't end with that. You know? Yeah, he even said, though he slay me, I'm still not going to turn on him. Mental, it's mine, I don't know about it, but it's mine to see beyond death. Yes. That death is not the end. And death is, you know, is, is, we're not defeated at death. We have, we have, we have overcome death, you yes. know. And, and, and it's easy to be deceived that death is the end. That this is all there is. But our rewards begin at death. If you have a camera, and that, I, I think that's exactly, I mean, that, that's a great point. If you have a camera and you can touch your screen or maybe your iPhone, you touch your screen to make it focus, right? If you focus on the foreground, if you got something in the foreground and you and you put and you put your finger on it, it focuses on that. What what does it do to out there? It blurs it, right? But if I tap out there, what does it do to here? It blurs it. And and I think that's I mean, I, I think that, that that would be an example of what you're talking about. Devil would love for us to keep tapping the foreground and just see that and keep all the Keep eternity in the blur. Where that needs to be where our focus is and not here. Because ultimately, that's what matters. And that's, that's what Job was saying. And, you know, I mean, that's why Jesus died and, was, and rose from the dead. Resurrection from the dead is important because that's what matters. Beyond that. We're all going to die. It's appointed that a man wants to die, but... After that, and, and the fact that the Bible then says after that, right, is important, is the judgment. And that's where my faith is going to come into play. And whether it has been what uh, Jesus Christ would have wanted it to be. You know, he takes the word of God out of our hearts. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19, the parable of the sower, remember that? The... the uh, Seed that fell by the road, right? And the birds came, right? And they took it. Seed was the gospel, right? It's the word of God, right? And, and, it, and if we're not careful, the devil will take it from us because ultimately if we're not moving forward in our faith, if we're not moving forward in our knowledge to God, we're, we're regressing. How many took Spanish in school? How many can speak it? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I took Greek and, and I still use it quite a bit, but I don't... I, I couldn't even begin to do what I had to do in school. If they, if I went, I'd flunk every Greek test there was if I went back and took a test. Um, because if we don't use those things, they go away, right? If we don't build, they go away. And the devil will, he will do those things. He, he will get us so busy that we can't study. He will bring, he'll, he'll, he'll get us every excuse under the sun to not be dedicated to knowing what God wants us to do. And in doing those things, if we let him do those things to us, he takes the word of God from us. He steals it from us. Uh, just as Jesus was talking about there in that parable. He puts wicked purposes into our hearts. You know, we can't... Every day, and every one of us have weaknesses, and every one of us have things we struggle with, and, and if you don't think you do, you're wrong... And maybe yours is self-deception because you actually, if you actually believe that, we all struggle with something. But we got to be fighting those things, folks. I can't use it as some kind of excuse. Well, I got a weakness. I, that, that, that's my weakness. I'm just going to go. No, I got to fight that because otherwise, he will let it. He he will stoke that fire. He will hit that weakness as much as he can. And I'm going to have to work hard to get those things out of my life so that he doesn't allow those wicked, doesn't, he isn't allowed to put those wicked purposes in our hearts. You know, when we look at Judas, and i got like three minutes, we look at Judas. First time we see Judas, Jesus talking about Judas wanting to betray him. Jesus talking about that there's a problem with one of the disciples. That's over a year before Judas actually betrays Jesus, but he's letting it exist. It appears to be in the form of greed, doesn't it? Because he was robbing from the, the purse. We know that. John makes it clear from that. Uh, you know, that Judas allowed these things to exist in his heart. The whole betrayal began the Saturday before when Jesus scolded Judas for getting on to Mary 
for uh, anointing him for his death. Remember, Jesus scolded them because they got on her. He said, well, she's done the right thing. And the next thing you see in every account is Judas then went to the high priest and asked him, what, what will you take for him? See, he just kept letting him live there. And then you come down to that Thursday night in the upper room. And Jesus has said things to him over and over, and he tells him, and the Bible says this, and Satan entered his heart. And then you hear those words of Jesus. What you do, do quickly. You know what? Jesus gave up, didn't he? This Roman, Romans 1 shows us that God, there's a point where God just lets you go do what you want to do if that's what you want to do. And, and at that point, Judas, you know, Jesus, as long as Judas hadn't made the decision, Jesus kept trying to encourage him not to. But when that point happened, nothing left to say but go. And he went. John has a powerful wording right there where he says, and he left, and it was dark. Don't you think that's a little bit of a, a, a symbol? His life had gone from being in the presence of the light into the world of darkness. Well, there's a lot of things we could talk about in regard to Satan, but we have we've addressed him in one way or another throughout, and it would be just a review. Um, but, uh, you know, he's certainly active. He's not some kind of figment of imagination. He's not some kind of metaphor. He is real, and he is evil, and you're in his sights, and so am I. And we need to be aware of that. But on the same line, looking at our class as a whole, we have myriads of angels on our side, don't we? ministering to us, taking care of us, protecting us, fighting in the spiritual realm on our behalf. And I have a God that is the most powerful of all. And the Lord who has died to save me. So the devil has no power over us except that which we give him. And may we not do that. Let's conclude our class with a word of prayer. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day that you've given to us. Father, we are so thankful to be able to have spent today serving you. We thank you that you allow us to be your sons and daughters. Father, we thank you so much for your love that sent Jesus to this earth to die upon that cross. Thank you so much for the resurrection that through the forgiveness of sins, through his blood, and through the power of his resurrection, we can one day be at home with you in heaven for all eternity. May we always keep our eyes ever focused on that. Father, we pray that you uh, go with us now. We pray that you be with us as we continue to serve you uh, as we leave this place. Father, we are so thankful tonight for Will and his decision, Father. We are so thankful for, to, for you that each and every one of us have that opportunity to make such a wonderful and blessed decision. We pray that you will be with him and bless him and, and be with him throughout his uh, years in service to you going forward. Father, we pray that you go with us now. Forgive us when we fail you. It is in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.